Upon perusing one of our many peer-reviewed source books, ancient infrastructures, remarkable roads, mines, walls, mounds, and stone circles compiled by William R. Corliss, containing, like his other many research books, hundreds of unexplainable, inexplicably mind-bending ancient anomalies, we stumbled across a most peculiar of ancient peculiarities, that of the so-called rocking stones. There are many demonstrations of this curious practice documented at sites dated to the Pleistocene era, found among ruins attributed to a primitive people, a people whom, although often making rudimentary shelters, would incorporate into them stones often weighing many tons. Any explanation as to why, or indeed how, these stones were chosen and then often set aloft with seeming ease predictably remains elusive. The descriptions by first explorers of these rocking rocks, according to Corliss, were in the hundreds and were documented in vast locations, yet they were mostly isolated to modern-day Britain. Quote, Most rocking stones are to be found in areas once covered by Pleistocene ice sheets. British and American journals of the 1700s and 1800s describe scores of rocking stones, yet they are virtually absent from professional publications past the 1900s. Thus, discussions of this phenomenon have been confined to amateur archaeological circles. Corliss continues, Rocking stones are large stones, often weighing many, many tons. Yet they were somehow once perfectly balanced, with an average-sized adult human being able to push and pull the stone with ease by hand." End quote. How did they once balance such enormous stones? Intriguingly, we feel that this is a mystery that is indeed possible to unravel, as a curious individual of the modern age once secretly did exactly this. Yet, infuriatingly, his explanation as to how died with him, either as a secret or, like so many others we have researched, his work covered up shortly after his passing. Known as Coral Castle, it was a place made from multi-ton megaliths, made of ancient corals, each either set aloft many meters in the air or perfectly balanced somehow all by this lone individual, one who is known as Edward Leedskalnen. The most interesting and interactive of spectacles at Edward's self-proclaimed castle is the nine-ton rotating door, which, as the name suggests, spins on its axis, made from a coral stone weighing nine tons, yet balanced perfectly, just like the ancient rocking stones. We have also covered the other remarkable case of the gentleman from America, who could and was recorded moving enormous objects, even an entire barn, simply by rolling them on small pebbles. Yet the reason to, or as to how pre-Ice Age man made these rocking stones, remains unexplained. Yet thanks to Corliss's tireless correlations, we also know that all these rocking stones are found in locations which also contain ancient dolmens. Thus, we know that the same civilization were responsible, yet who these people once were is a question which we will continue to find highly compelling. There are many ancient monuments found all over the Earth which possess extraordinarily precise solar and lunar alignments. Ingenious designs, often many thousands of years old, constructed from stones, sometimes quarried, cut, and transported to the sites from many miles away. This movement of megaliths was accomplished using techniques or technology as yet not understood, and to date, many of these megalithic stone placements are perceived as near-impossible feats of ancient engineering. And although many impressive examples of monuments which track the sun can be found to have originated from many different civilizations, the most notable of antiquity, most famous for a seemingly obsessive level of monuments devoted to the observing of the sun's path, was undoubtedly the Neolithics. One has to wonder, why was there such a fixation? Was the motivation for this mass of undertakings of a tragic nature? Was it out of fear? Fear created by a memory of a catastrophic event, possibly involving the sun's powerful emittance of radiation? Maybe they experienced the consequences of an ancient warming cycle. We may never know. 
Yet the most important question in our field is not why these volumes of solar-aligned relics were created, but how. How did our ancient ancestors, claimed as having existed over 10,000 years ago, construct such precisely positioned granges, hinges, barrows, and sun daggers? Something we have previously covered, an incredible type of sundial which tracked a sunspot across the wall of an ancient cave with each month, solstice and new year precisely marked out across the walls. Yet the sundials in question in this video are a group of far more familiarly designed dials left by the Neolithics. These sun-tracking dials can be found across the Neolithic sites of Ireland, Scotland, Orkney, and England. First discovered by an American by the name of Martin Brennan, a 39-year-old from New York. Not only did he discover the true function of curbstones located in Noth, codename K7, K15 among others. He also cracked the earliest form of writing while studying the Irish Stone Age artwork. Earlier this year, a theory emerged on the internet by writer and journalist Ben Gagna. He suggested that there was an image of a swan on curbstone 15 at Nonth. He claimed that while examining a photo he had taken of K15, he flipped it upside down and saw something no one had ever seen before – the faint but unmistakable image of a swan in profile. The true meaning or purpose of the curbstones had for a long time been heavily debated within certain circles. The intriguing cup and ring marks had been known of for some time. Yet as previously mentioned, though the most popular theory of the design on K15 was the claim that it was the depiction of a swan glyph, this hypothesis was rejected even before Martin's unarguably accurate translation was discovered. Martin identified the sundial while examining a passage mount in the Boyne Valley. And although sundials thousands of years old have been excavated throughout Europe, many specialist individuals reviewing Martin's finds believe that the sundial discovered in County Meath is the oldest and possibly most important ever found. According to Martin, who has been studying megalithic Irish art for the last 10 years, Ireland's megalithic tombs are suffering from appalling neglect. Some of the most important passage mounds excavated previously have been ignored or, conveniently, completely sealed up. Martin's discoveries are undoubtedly remarkable and are of tremendous value to our ongoing deciphering of ancient antiquity and its past civilizations. It is a journey of discovery we find highly compelling. If we could prove beyond doubt that our continued posit of an ancient, once highly advanced yet pre-Ice Age civilization once existing here on our planet, we would literally have to rewrite our understandings of antiquity. We have covered numerous sites, found submerged all around the world. Yet, unfortunately, due to their proximity to islands and the continental regions they are found amongst, many are dismissed as merely being 5 to 10,000 year old ruins, fitting with modern paradigm and, alas, avoiding controversy or the questions which inevitably follow. Yet our next side of interest may turn out to not only be that most important of submerged ruins ever found on Earth but the smoking gun previously mentioned. On the 19th of May 2001, India's Union Minister for the Science and Technology Division, Murli Manohar Joshi, announced that the ruins of an ancient civilization had been discovered off the coast of Gujarat, in the Gulf of Kambahat. The site was discovered by INOT, 
National Institute for Ocean Technology. Using sonar, the discovered ruin is now being strongly argued as definitively pre-Ice Age, yet also advanced in nature. NIOT went on to describe an area of regularly spaced artificial structures. Located 20 kilometers from the Gujarat coast and spans 9 kilometers, Joshi claims the site as an urban settlement that predates the Indus Valley Civilization. Further descriptions of the site by Joshi describe it as containing regularly spaced dwellings, a granary, a bath, a citadel, and a drainage system. According to Wiki, Quote, the structures and artifacts discovered by NIOT are the subject of contention. The major disputes surrounding the Gulf of Combat cultural complex are claims about the existence of submerged city-like structures, the difficulty associating dated artifacts with the site itself, and disputes about whether stone artifacts recovered at the site are actually geofacts or artifacts. One major complaint is that artifacts at the site were recovered by dredging, instead of being recovered during a controlled archaeological excavation." End quote. Simply put, due to the fact that it has not been excavated properly, and we predict probably never will, academia are dismissing this ancient city as simply unconfirmed. We feel a quite ridiculous position to take despite NIOT's supporting data of its existence due to its accidental discovery, presumably via dredging. We find the marine archaeology in the Gulf of Kambat highly compelling. There are countless submerged and very ancient cities dotted across the oceans of our Earth. Many of these cities all but forgotten until their rediscoveries within the modern era. When attempting to locate these mysterious places, it is beneficial for one to be aware of past sea levels. This, of course, can make the task of locating these submerged cities an awful lot easier. The main consensus is that world sea levels have largely stayed the same since the arrival of Homo sapiens, only really dipping or rising by around 120 meters across the Earth. When discussing these finds, you will, on all but a few exceptions, find yourself within these specific regions. One of the more interesting exceptions to this rule has to be the underwater city which was discovered just off the coast of Cuba a few years ago, a submerged city which sits over 700 meters below the waves. This depth, of course, being far below that which has experienced a breach over the past hundred or so thousand years. A theory that the landmass once rested upon the surface, subsequently being sunk by tectonic activities, was argued. Yet since its exploration as a possibility, it has been found to have not been the case. The results of this investigation strongly indicating that this city and its accompanying landmass somehow remained under the waves for more than a hundred thousand years. Greenville Draper of Florida's International University concluded that it was highly unlikely that such a tectonic event could have occurred, quoted as saying, Nothing of this magnitude has been reported ever before, especially from the Mediterranean. Draper's, among many others' analysis, has of course come to conclusions. Conclusions which thankfully appear honest, making them extremely controversial. Yet as with other fields of study in life, they are reluctant to reveal the implications of such conclusions. For example, if the research is correct, and judging by the extremely capable people tasked with this undertaking, there is no reason to suspect it is not, then this submerged city has remained submerged for over a hundred thousand years. This gives us two possible alternatives. One, that the city predates the arrival of developed man on Earth, according to academically accepted timelines. Or two, it reinforces our ever-growing accusations here at Mystery History of a past here on Earth which is unimaginably more ancient than we have been led to believe. A human society which has flourished and regressed on no less than three occasions. It could, of course, be both. There is a possibility that this ancient city was indeed built submerged under the waves by a once highly advanced civilization of Homo sapiens. Yet a more likely scenario, of course, would be that this ancient city was constructed at a time when the Caribbean Sea was a dry basin, and as the sea began to form, it was subsequently submerged. 
Yet, alas, modern academia readily rejects such a hypothesis. So, if we do not accept this as a likely possibility, then we must conclude that a primitive ancient culture, with primitive stone tools, and certainly no diving equipment, were somehow responsible for the construction of this submerged city, complete with enormous pyramids, on a foundation resting over 700 meters beneath the Caribbean Sea. Hey guys, in 1998, a circle of timber posts within the intertidal zone on the North Norfolk coast was brought to the attention of the Norfolk County Council Archaeological Service. A subsequent program of archaeological recording and dating revealed that the structure was constructed in the spring or early summer of 2049 BC, during the Early Bronze Age. Because of the perceived threat of damage and erosion from the sea, a rescue excavation was undertaken during the summer months of 1999. The structure was entirely excavated, involving the removal of the timbers and a program of stratigraphic recording and environmental analysis. A survey was also undertaken within the environs of the site, which has identified further timber structures dating from the Bronze Age. Detailed examination of the timber from the circle has produced a wealth of unexpected information, which has greatly added to our understanding of early Bronze Age woodworking, organization of labor, and the layout and construction of timber ritual monuments. The purpose of Seahenge will undoubtedly be added to the heated debate surrounding that of Stonehenge. The strongest argument so far for such henges has been that of celebratory pilgrimage sites during solstices. Although they remain a mystery, the excavation report was published in 2004 in the National Journal of Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society. A more popular, heavily illustrated account will be published by English Heritage this year. The Holm Tilmer Circle, aka Seahenge, is currently undergoing conservation treatment at the Mary Rose Center in Portsmouth. When this work is completed, the treated timbers will be displayed in the refurbished Lynn Museum in King's Linen, the UK. As always, thanks for watching, guys. Take care. The Sea of Galilee. Although not a real sea, it has remained named as such due to the staunch traditions, mainly religious, which have grown and flourished from around its shores. The first century historian, Flavius Josephus, for example, was so impressed by the areas surrounding the Sea of Galilee, he once wrote, quote, One may call this place the ambition of nature. Reporting a thriving fishing industry around the lake, with well over 200 boats regularly working the waters, archaeologists have since discovered only one such fishing vessel, found in 1986. It has been nicknamed the Jesus Boat. According to Christian religion, much of the ministry of Jesus Christ himself actually occurred upon the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and a recent discovery within the waters themselves has continued to perplex specialists within the area, astounding all who have been exploring said discovery, and weighs an estimated 60,000 tons according to researchers, an astonishing size making it much heavier than any of our modern-day warships. Rising nearly 32 feet out of the ancient sea's sediment, it also has a diameter of about 230 feet. Stonehenge, for example, which is an impressive ancient structure in its own right, has an outer stone circle diameter of only half that. First discovered in 2003 using sonar exploration of the southwest portion of the sea, divers have since been down to investigate the presumably ancient structure, writing regarding their finds within the latest issue of International Journal of Nautical Archaeology. Researcher Yitzhak Paz, Antiquities Authority, and Ben Gurion University believes it could date back more than 4,000 years. Quote, the more logical possibility is that it belongs to the 3rd millennium BC, because there are other megalithic phenomena from that time that are found close by, Paz told LiveScience.com in an interview, noting that those sites are associated with fortified settlements. Could it be that this is where the peoples of Bet Yura buried and honored their dead? Is this a proverbial city of the dead, or something else entirely? As more research is undertaken, it is only a matter of time before we understand this amazing structure for what it truly once was. We will of course keep you posted. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care.